Friends, it's, uh, it's that time of year again, that time when we consider what has come to pass in the seasons of our lives, when we take stock and consider the changes we feel called to make, when we speak with friends and loved ones about what could be for us in the seasons to come, how indeed we could be better. Yeah, for many around the world, this time of year marks the holiest, the most introspective, interior-searching time in every sacred year of our shared lives. That's right. It's baseball season. Yes! <laughs> yes! Some of you might have thought I'd be talking about the Lenten season, <laughs> which did begin this past week. So extra credit to those of you who thought that, but no. <laughs> as important as that may be to some of those around the world, I'm the one with the microphone, so <laughs> we're going to talk about baseball. <laughs> now many, many have heard me share that I think my favorite thing to do on this island is to go to Friday night Rainbow Warrior baseball games. Every single thing about this experience is delightful to me. I live just steps from the stadium, so it's a short little walk. The seats I have are at field level, with nothing between me or the action, which makes watching for left-handed batters foul balls a bit of the sport of it all. One of my favorite parts of the experience is the beginning of every game. I require that if a friend is going with me, they come for the beginning of the game. Because over the public address system, we hear, will you now rise and remove your caps for the singing of our national anthems? Yeah. The crowd rises, and either a recording or a live person sings the Star Spangled Banner. Usually, in the crowd, no one actually really sings along that much. Now, this might be because when the recording is played, for those of you who have been there, the stadium plays a version of the Star Spangled Banner that sounds kind of like a mix between a vocal jazz ensemble and the Beach Boys. <laughs> it's almost like someone went out and found a recording of the song, which is musically excellent, but almost impossible to sing along with. <laughs> it's really high, and it just has all these funny chords. And then some visitors prepare to sit. I've seen it. But then something else happens. The opening strain of Hawaii Pono E starts, the anthem of the Hawaiian kingdom under King Kalakaua. And seemingly from nowhere, voices start to rise in harmony. Many, many more voices sing Hawaii Pono E than ever sing the Star Spangled Banner at these games. And the cheering after that anthem, the chi hoos, and the voices rising from the stands are stirring and noticeable, especially for visitors from the continent. Now, a few weeks ago, the father of probably my favorite player was visiting from Houston and was seated right next to me. Before the second anthem, and then uh, after it was done, I could see him kind of looking around, like, what's going on here? His only audible comment was, I thought only uh, Texas was allowed to fly the state flag at the same height as the American flag. <laughs> Look, I, I, I love this guy, so if he watches this, we became friends. I apologize in advance. But what he was expressing was a clear and well-known truth that many of us know. Texans only think about Texas. <laughs> right? All right? But what was also clear was that this message the stadium was sending was received loud and clear. This is a place, this is a land that will never truly be beholden to another nation. Perhaps the message is something like, we are in that nation, but not of it. Not for everyone but for some people. But putting baseball aside, we are now in the Christian season of Lent. This is the season when the Christian members of our human family once more enter into that time inspired by the Hebrew scriptures of considering their actions over the past year, 
and then humbly asking perhaps a power greater than themselves or even those, those loved ones around them for forgiveness. But repentance and forgiveness are not only for the religious people. They are an ancient tradition practiced still by many who don't believe in a divine force or that can take or give anything like uh, repentance or forgiveness. But luckily, humanity on this subject of repenting and forgiving can easily be sorted into two categories. Not sheep and goats. <laughs> two categories, which are neatly delineated by a common uniting force known very well throughout the world. Kevin Costner. <laughs> See, in matters of faith, in matters of faith, you are either a Field of Dreams person or a Bull Durham person. <laughs> those, uh, those two movies about baseball, and for those of you who don't know, they're two movies about baseball. <laughs> I was just going to kind of go on with that. Uh, also starring Kevin Costner. Yes. So, for those of you who don't know, Field of Dreams is a beautiful story about a farmer who hears a voice that calls upon him to mow down his corn and build a baseball field in the middle of it. And when he does, the spirits or the ghosts of some of the greatest players of all time appear and begin playing on the field. The themes of prophethood, of belief, of forgiveness, of repentance, God and relationships uh, with one's family are very much there on the field for all to see. Now, Bull Durham <laughs> is more of a sexy, raunchy, romantic comedy where a journeyman catcher with aching knees is relegated to the minor leagues to groom young pitchers bound for the big leagues. And Kevin Costner, his character, shows us the reality, the brutality, the pain, and the work it takes to do the only thing he's ever loved, to play baseball, even if it's causing him pain and humiliates him from time to time. But the action in that one is really set in motion by the entrancing and the brilliant character played by Susan Sarandon, yes. who shares his love of baseball, perhaps transcends it, and loves its intricacies, its statistical anomalies, its complete chance, and stunning beauty. Her take on baseball captures the sublime, for sure, if not the <coughs> divine. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, so we have the Field of Dreams way of seeing the world, and we have the Bull Durham way of seeing the world. You're all such good sports going with me on this. <laughs> and not, not to ruin the ending for anyone of either movie, but both of these approaches show powerfully the ways their characters and many in the world find that elusive element of so many of our lives, joy. One, by following what seems like a supernatural call to do something hard and frankly silly in the world. And another, by churning out day after live long day the painful truth of existence in service to something we love. But it's clear what unites these messages of possibility of joy. Kevin Costner. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. It's doing something challenging, something hard, something difficult. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about someone who is not me. You got it? <laughs> In another time, in another place, a young law student say, <laughs> just say, might or might not have been invited to work for a winter between semesters of law school at a firm in New York City. And this student might or might not have found a sublet in kind of a hip and fun, up and coming part of the city and discovered that the sublet, sublet was exactly 40 days and 40 nights. And that 40-day period might or might not have ended exactly on the very first day of Lent. And so that idealistic, young, adventurous, and deeply culturally Catholic student might or might not have decided that those 
Those 40 days leading up to Lent would be named by him Anti-Lent. <laughs> when he would really live it up in the greatest city of the world and do all the things that he'd need an entire 40 days to repent for doing. <laughs> not me. And this student may or may not have been in his early 20s, so none of this should be held against him in the least. <laughs> this student who is definitely not me. <laughs> but something happened in that period. In the wilderness, of the churning, churning, seemingly eternal good times. Somewhere, somewhere, around day 37, he thinks, he couldn't get out of bed. He didn't want to get out of bed. A way of living that seemed so joyful, so fun on television and in the movies, a way of being that seemed alluring and exciting, a way of self-satisfaction, self-determination, self, 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 self. The adventure that student thought was just waiting for him to take hold of wrecked his body, hurt his soul exhausted every spiritual resource he had, and he couldn't even finish the 40 days of anti that <laughs> he signed up for. But he might have a tattoo to remember it. <laughs> and instead, he cut out early for the safety of home. And for a time, not much happened. But later in life, when he had choices to make about how to spend his time. He remembered this period of anti-Lent and what it felt like to feed only his own desires of fun and excess. And chose slowly, choice by choice, options in his young life that would help others more than himself, that would feed the needs of his human family, perhaps more than his own needs, and somehow as the distance between his failed 40 days and any particular day in his future lengthened, that distance seemed to warm and to change. And rather than feeling shame or guilt, not only over some of the choices he made, but of not even being able to finish making the choices he wanted to, he began to feel something else, something like contentment, something like happiness, something at times even like joy. And today, this person is fond of telling people, there ain't no such thing as a misspent youth. So you can read all you want, you can watch all the movies about baseball you want all day long, trust me, I've done it. But when you come down to it, to find joy, real joy, we need to be in touch first with what it means to suffer what it means to hurt. Our opening hymn today has lyrics that I love. Not only are they super Unitarian Universalists, <laughs> but they boldly and without apology claim a goddess. Yes. And the name of that goddess? Joy. Yes. Sorry, I'm getting really loud with the mic. I really love that hymn. <laughs> And then the lyrics describe what that goddess inspires in her followers, mad with rapture, to the portal, the, thy holy fane, which means shrine or temple, we come. Mad with rapture, we come. Now for some reason in the United States, lyrics by another writer became very popular, which are joyful, joyful, we adore thee. I think Sister Act Two has something to do with that, <laughs> rightfully so. But these are not the original lyrics, this joyful, joyful, we adore thee. As often as they are sung exclaiming joy in adoring God, they are not what Friedrich Schiller, the composer of the original text, intended. You may not believe this, but what we sang today, which sounds like a super UU translation, are the correct real lyrics and translation from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Choral Symphony. Who didn't know that? That's right. That's an awesome thing. <laughs> Learn something today, folks. Get ready. Has anyone ever seen a performance of the Ninth Symphony live? 
All right. Don't give it away. And, and sung in it. All right. Everyone should, by the way. The way that this symphony usually is performed is that you enter the auditorium and you take your seat, like everyone is here. All the while, the symphony orchestra, like usual, kind of trickles in. And behind them, a massive choir is seated. And then, for the entire first three movements of the symphony, the choir just sits. Then, in the fourth movement, after you've been looking at these people, just sitting there, kind of happy, kind of curious, but just sitting there. About halfway through the fourth movement, the music changes suddenly. And that choir that was just sitting there for an hour suddenly rises. It's breathtaking. I have heard people literally gasp when it happens. And then, for the next 20 minutes, these choristers volley the most radiant, glimmering, and exuberant expressions of joy from part to part and out, rolling over the audience, joyful expressions that the composer never got to hear. Because by the premiere of this music-altering symphony, I dare say a history-altering symphony, its composer, Ludwig von Beethoven, was almost totally dead. The story goes that he tried to conduct this symphony, but there was a man standing behind him with a baton keeping the real time. Because <laughs> after it ended, Beethoven was still conducting three more measures. <laughs> the whole time, though, that he was writing this symphony, his hearing was getting worse and worse and worse. Imagine the pain of a great composer losing his hearing. That's not hard to do. Now, imagine his response to this pain. Creating something for everybody else with hearing. Something that might truly change their lives forever, even if they didn't realize he did. Something born, bred, and made divine out of the giving and giving and giving of the very thing fate was taking and taking and taking from him. Is it really that strange that someone would do something for others that they could not do for themselves? Is it really that strange that someone would value the care and experience that others are having over the experience they get to have? Is it really that strange that someone puts aside wants and petty desires for their own pleasure to offer others joy? Yeah, you better believe it is. And it's getting stranger and stranger in these times that we are sharing, my friends. But I have some good news for you, my friends, my beloveds. In case you didn't know it, this church and all of us here, we're a little strange too. <laughs> all of the things this church hopes to grow so boldly of all of those, joy is becoming more and more strange to others every day. You can tell me if I'm wrong, but that's what I am seeing out there. Our culture seems bent on pulling us deeper and deeper into news feeds that we make for ourselves, music choices we curate for ourselves, right in our hands, right at our fingertips, are devices that want and want and want us to do everything by ourselves. <coughs> and that may be a recipe for pleasure at times. It might even lead some to happiness or contentment at other times. But can someone tell me whether the world they experience totally, along, or with the many devices drawing us into our own devised and curated isolation, can anyone tell us that that activity brings us joy? Like true joy? If not, that's okay. Because that's actually a good start. Millennia of wisdom from many faiths and teachers of all stripes tell us that it is from the garden of pain 
of suffering, of I dare say despair, out of which joy blooms, where it blossoms into its being. It glides patiently along the sacred thread between what we have lost in our lives, and then it brightens to show us what we have found. Sometimes that joy literally jumps up at us. It springs out of a group of people assembled together with the devoted intention to inspire joy in others. Sometimes it comes at the insistence of a voice or a presence outside of ourselves. Sometimes it comes in the form of a goddess or an angel who leaves the head of her pin to sing smooth jazz or explain the sublimity of baseball. It does not matter, truly, whether the call we hear to inspire that joy is a call from a voice in the cornfield of Iowa or a call from the second row of a minor league stadium in North Carolina to keep our eye on the ball. The call is the same. It is the call to rise when the music changes, the call to rise together, to be together, and to sing of a world that is different, that is set apart from a world others tell us must be so. To rise up together and sing of a land of oceans, feeding rivers and flowing into streams that needs a people at times to defend her. To rise up at last and sing to the goddess of joy, thank you, thank you, Thank you for this day and the fountain of joy that springs up in us this morning, especially when we've known what it's like to wish we would never wake again. In a faith that calls us to find so much of our own way, it can feel like we might be in this world, but not of it. And on an island far from a continent that claims dominion over it, it's blessedly simple to feel part of a nation, but not of it. So in this month of joy, when we consider so many lives through Women's History Month that seem for too long not to be part of the broader history, the broader narrative, when we consider what joy might really feel like emanating from these walls, or the isolation we may feel in some ways, which is deeply, deeply human, that it might emanate instead out into these lands. And the community that we find here, or in another part of our heart, a community that must rise up together to show true compassion, a community that must rise up with unity to bring about justice, and a community must rise up as one to help those who are in need of the care and the support we can offer here, we strange fellows here on this mountain, to boldly grow joy. Look at it, because mad with rapture, here we come. May it ever be so, our joy and our very lives may just depend on it. Blessed be and amen.